Hey EMM, it's Mason here to tell you about an exciting new opportunity we are offering. In an effort to tangibly improve our organization's commitment to equity, diversity, and inclusion, we created the Diversity and Inclusion Award that fourth-year medical students that identify as underrepresented in medicine and are applying to emergency medicine residencies are eligible to apply for starting today. We understand that the cost of applying to residency adds up, and we want to do what we can to ease that financial burden. We are extending three $200 awards to selected individuals following a blinded review of all applications. Applications will be accepted through the end of November, and winners will be announced mid-December. Check out our website at www.emergencymedicalminute.org backslash EDI dash award for all the details and to access the free application or click the link in our show notes. Thank you. We're back. We're, we're back. We'll I'm well up. hydrated and we're back. <laughs> so I think we have a lot more to talk about. And yes. I look forward to learning more about some of the inoperable things that we now have some solutions for and some of the techniques that you use in the OR because it sounds like there's like black lights and lasers and knives and drills and all the cool toys. So. All of the above, sometimes all at once. Yes. yes. Uh, so when I lecture about brain surgery techniques, there's a, there's a Walter Dandy sketch that I absolutely love, which I, I almost wish there was a visual aid, but basically it, it's a patient that is sketched in a coronal section, so you just see their brain, and you see a little clamp occluding the, uh, the middle cerebral artery, and you see a big bone defect, and you see a hand, uh, like literal, like a, like a hand kind of scooping a tumor out, just like no, no bipolars, no, uh, no suctions, just literally just a human hand scooping the tumor out of the human brain like a, like a dainty version of like gorillas picking insects out of each other's fur in the jungles. That's how neurosurgery has evolved, right? So we started, well, actually, I, I shouldn't say not even neurosurgery, but surgery, right? So the first surgeries um, were done without general anesthesia. Uh, and so patients, uh, patients had to endure um, incalculably horrific pain for whatever disease process was affecting them that uh, frequently was terminal anyway. We invented anesthesia. We invented sterile techniques. Uh, so all of these things that I get to do in the operating room that give patients like a fighting chance of even surviving my surgeries, uh, I've come to take for granted. And then really over the last few decades, microsurgery has really evolved. So the resolution of our microscopes is better. The optics of our microscopes is better. At Swedish, uh, I'm going to be introducing a new exoscope where not only do I have enhanced tumor visualization, but I'll actually have better ergonomics for myself as a surgeon. This is literally a robotic exoscopic arm that follows me around, tracks my instruments, and I'm not even looking into the brain itself. I'm looking on a giant three-dimensional screen wearing 3D glasses as I'm taking out the surgery while getting the best possible perspective uh, as I'm just kind of sitting in the chair. Talk about uh, living in the future, Eddie. Uh, Can you even have fathomed that when uh, you started med school? Yeah, I uh, I don't know what I was fathoming when I started med school. <laughs> uh, but it's it, this is the future, right? Where I have an arm that it's like having a third arm. It's voice controlled. And more importantly, uh, I always tell my patients this because this really was the contrast that I was forced to confront. Um, I spent some time in Uganda doing some work with my program director at Duke, Mike Hagland, who goes out there a few times a year to do a few things. One, he started a resident training program in Uganda. Second of all, Duke University sends hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars in medical equipment, as well as technicians that can service that equipment uh, out to, to Uganda every year. And so he provides free neurosurgical care. He recruits other neurosurgeons to go with him. And uh, I, was, I was given an opportunity as a senior resident to go there as well with him. 
and do brain tumor surgeries. We don't have, certainly we don't have that particular toy. In fact, most hospitals in the United States don't have that particular toy, uh, and we do at Swedish. But we have neuronavigation, right, where it's literally GPS miniaturized to the scale of my operating room, and I know because I've registered the patient in real time to their preoperative neuroimaging exactly where I am using a pointer or uh, or another instrument that I've registered against the device. And then uh, we have uh, stereo taxi where I can use those previously registered points to, with millimetric accuracy, be able to implant a laser into the brain of a patient patient, which I can then use as I robotically steer it to gently shape heat to a lesion as the patient is in an MRI scanner, which every eight seconds runs real-time thermography on the lesion and the area of brain around it. So I can literally steer a robot from a control room that is using a laser to heat tissue through a two millimeter not even burr hole in the patient's head, which I'll later close with a single stitch to treat their brain tumor or their radiation necrosis. In fact, we use it to treat seizures as well. So I didn't have that in Uganda. And so uh, you're trying to use like external landmarks, like literally phrenology to figure out where uh, where exactly the patient's tumor is going to be and then using landmarks once you get in there to, to get into the brain. And what that means is bigger incisions, bigger craniotomies, like it doesn't have to be that way, right? So now I do keyhole craniotomies. Uh, every patient has a small, usually linear or curvilinear incision. I make just enough of uh, a bone opening to access the, the area that I need to access. I can look around corners with endoscopes and actually also with exoscopes. So uh, like with a 30 degree endoscope, I don't need to even be able to directly see the area that I'm working on. I can, uh, I can see around corners now and I can, and I can work around corners. I can use endoscopes to make even smaller incisions, make surgeries even easier to recover from, and ultimately make things safer. So the same exoscope that I was referencing earlier, it's built by a company called Synaptive, and they have developed really advanced algorithms for imaging white matter tracts within the human brain. And so prospectively, I can define using regions of interest, what are the areas that not only are important in the human brain that I want to preserve, but what are the white matter tracts that are connecting those important areas? And in fact, for deep-seated lesions, after I calculate where those white matter tracts are, I can devise surgical trajectories to that patient's tumor that will preserve all those white matter tracts. So I mentioned earlier, like, any idiot can take out a tumor. Yeah, but... Now, an idiot with a tool is still a tool, I guess, but it's nice to have tools where I can design an optimal trajectory to a patient's tumor where I know exactly what is happening between the external world and where the tumor is. I know what the least invasive path there is. I can perform that surgery technically because of all the instruments I've been gifted with. And then finally, that patient is going to have a shorter hospital stay, they're not going to have neurodeficits postoperatively, and they're going to have a survival advantage. At the end of the day, they're going to live longer with a higher quality of life because of all these techniques that we can now use. And you fold in brain mapping, so I can use stimulation as I'm taking out a tumor or as I'm approaching the borders of a tumor to use electrophysiology, because there's a guy sitting next to me looking at little waves on a screen corresponding to the stimulation that I'm imparting on the brain. How close am I in real life to the corticospinal tract? How close am I to uh, to the arcuate fasciculus? How close am I to these tracts for which there is no redundant function? And then I can make decisions. How much more tumor can I take out? Or how much more tumor infiltrated tissue can I take out? So these decisions, they're, they're not made in a vacuum. They have to be made based on a substrate. And now I have all this information. I have a wealth of information to make those decisions. And I have really, really it just shockingly advanced tools to be able to manifest them. This sounds truly like science fiction. Yes. Like how, how recently has most of this evolved to be at your fingertips? In the last, like, five years. Uh, all of it is iterative, right? So uh, we've had surgical microscopes for some time. Well, we've only we've only recently begun introducing filters where I can use 5-amino levulinic acid in my surgeries. So 5-ALA is a prodrug metabolized. There's going to be a test on this later, by the way. Uh, metabolized to a compound called protoporphyrin 9, which is fluorescent. It then continues to be metabolized through the bilirubin pathway and excreted, except in tumor cells, because they have defects in the, in the bilirubin processing pathway, and it accumulates, and it glows. It's violet. It's really beautiful, actually. And using that, 
Well, now I don't just have a microscope where I can zoom in and zoom out. Now I have a microscope that helps me distinguish between tumor and not tumor. Well, that's useful, uh, <laughs> right? Uh, so uh, that's that's really, really good. And we've gotten better not just at stimulating the brain. We've had Ogeman stimulators since... Um, uh, well, since the days of George Ogeman in, uh, in I want to say, probably the 80s. In fact, his uh, I'm, I'm going to give a shout out to one of George Ogeman's sons, Steve, who does practice in the neighborhood and is uh, a mentor and a friend, one of, one of my inspirations for going into neurosurgery. Um, but we've been able to stimulate brain for a long time. That's easy, right? You have a two-pronged probe, you touch the brain with it, and you abrogate whatever function it is that you're touching within a, a certain volume. But how good are you at testing the function? right? So you're only as good as the test. So we have, again, this is not something that I've done. This is something where I'm sitting on the shoulders of giants. In this case, speech pathologists. We've invented really, really good tests to figure out, well, does the patient have executive deficits? Does the patient have speech deficits? What kind of speech deficits are they going to have? Are these going to be, uh, are these going to be persistent after surgery? How close can I get to the speech pathways and have a reversible deficit as opposed to a permanent one. So absolutely, in the last few weeks, I've walked into a few patients' rooms after an awake craniotomy where I did brain mapping for language, and the patient had a language deficit. They didn't have a language deficit when I was actually mapping the brain and resecting the tumor, and I can very confidently, based on the mapping and based on the anatomy that I know that I was looking at, based on my neuronavigation, and based on the post-operative MRI, say, hey, listen, right now, your speech is not quite right. The reason for that is post-operative swelling. I know that the circuits that are responsible for your speech are intact. Give it three weeks, you're going to be speaking normally. And two weeks later, they come into my clinic for their post-op visit, and they have almost normal speech. And then six weeks later, they come into my clinic again for uh, their follow-up MRI visit, and they have absolutely normal speech. So again, I didn't elucidate any of these, um, any of this neuroanatomy. I didn't elucidate any of these testing paradigms. This is all just something that we iteratively have learned, gotten better at, and now I can take advantage of those techniques, the techniques the speech pathologists have, the electrophysiologists have, somebody out there that knows something about optics, because it sure isn't me, that enables me to have an exoscope, that knows about the bilirubin pathway. Please don't ask me anything about the bilirubin pathway. Like, but they've figured out enough about this to be able to give me tools that I can use, and all those tools can be intelligently layered to provide a more gentle, more safe, and more complete surgery. And that, that again, it's all in service of the same thing. I'm buying people time, uh, and hopefully I'm buying people good time. So I, I'm just lucky to, to have been born at, at a time when I can use those tools. Like if I'd been born in the 50s and 60s, I'd be scooping brain tumors out of people with my bare hands like, like everybody else <laughs> like was. Like the good old days, <laughs> like right? Like the good old days. Uh, so yeah, it's something that uh, continues to be refined. It's something that I'm really lucky to be part of an ecosystem of, uh, of clinicians that uh, cares deeply and cares deeply about innovating. So again, I'm, I'm lucky to be a part of the Sarah Cannon Cancer Network where we have clinical trials, we're using cutting edge techniques. And frankly, we have not just the money, that's the easy part in a hospital system, but also the willpower to innovate and collaborate. Uh, that's where the leading edge of care happens. So I would imagine that every case is different and the way that you treat every case has to be different based on how the tumor presents, how the patient presents, their age, their comorbid factors, all those things. Yeah. But has there been a transition from the old way, as it were, of doing things to the current way? What is is your go-to, or does it really depend too much to even give an answer on that as yeah. far as technique? Yeah. So not even in terms of technique, or but technology. in terms of surgical decision-making, yeah. uh, because surgical technique boils down to, can I safely accomplish this surgery? And not even safely, but, um, well, yes, safely. But in addition to safely, is there a conceivable benefit to doing the surgery in the first place? And the example that I like the most, again, this, this has nothing to do, not even just with me, but with neurosurgeons. So there has been an astonishing amount of innovation in the field of cancer treatment in general. So we have access to immunotherapy now. There was a landmark paper that was published about melanomas and use of immunotherapy for patients with stage four, that is metastasis to brain and spine melanoma. I just did a melanoma this past week that was metastatic to brain. So we used to tell patients once they had a brain metastasis, like 
we're kind of out of options. I, I don't know if there's any any good strategies for you. Uh, this was as recently as 10 or 15 years ago. And then we started using immunotherapy for these patients. Jesus Christ, in that study, uh, the, the study, I think, did not reach its median survival at 30 months. They just ran out of time, so they stopped it. So these patients are living years with stage four melanoma. That's, that has nothing to do with me, with any other neurosurgeon. That's just a function of we've devised drugs to control their systemic cancer. Certainly that's true for receptor positive breast cancer. That's true for lung cancer. Like, so we've made incremental advances in the way that these patients are treated for the systemic disease. Well, what does that mean? Now, if I know that someone's prognosis outside of their stage four disease is pretty good, well, now, instead of giving them a surgery to recover from for the last three months of their lives, I can improve their quality of life and also extend their life with a surgery or something like a surgery. So now, all of a sudden, there's patients that can benefit from tumor-directed treatment when they have tumors in their brain or spine. So that's part of it. And then the second part of it is, well, now, between all of these techniques, tumor visualization on, on one side and brain mapping on the other side, where I can accomplish really, really safe and complete resections of tumors, and in many cases, super total resections of infiltrative brain tumors, such as gliomas, well, if I can do that safely, well, now we can actually have an interesting conversation with the patient. What are your priorities? What are your values? What do you want out of the rest of your life? What does the rest of your life look like to you? Can I offer a surgery that's in service of those values and those goals? If the answer is no, that's okay. Uh, and in fact, like this was like a really, really macabre game that my co-chiefs and I used to play when we were residents. Like, what would you do if you got a GBM? Like, uh, it, we we always we always played that game. And honestly, like depending on the size, location, etc. There is a, a real possibility that if I were to be diagnosed with a glioblastoma, I'd pack a suitcase full of Decadron, and none of you would ever see me again. And that would be it. <laughs> like, that's it. Uh, like, no surgery, no Temidar, no, no radiation. That's like, that, uh, uh, it was nice knowing Eddie, I guess. I wonder where he went. Um, and I'd be somewhere, but I'm not telling you where. So... Um, that's, that's part of it. But uh, frequently there is a surgery that we can devise in, in service of that. And then when I try to think about, well, what's important to this person? Is this a young, very, uh, very active, very athletic person? Certainly motor function is going to be paramount, right? And that's easy. That's uh, so when I'm making decisions about what can I leave and what can I take. Motor strip, corticospinal tract, things that are important for motor function are a no-go. For almost anybody, everybody wants to be able to get around on their own. They need to be able to use their hands on their own. Speech, that's a no-go. Again, that's easy. Although th there are some nuances there because there's uh, there's some, some recent data, and maybe not even that recent at this point, coming out of, say, UCSF, that you can actually resect speech motor cortex, and the underlying white matter tracks will be able to remap such that that patient will be able to speak down the line. So here's where it's actually going to get interesting. The more nuanced functions, executive functions, uh, really parietal lobe functions, but to a certain extent bilateral frontal lobe functions. And particularly in the setting of infiltrative tumors that grow slowly, like low-grade gliomas, we know that the brain has a high capacity for remapping. So what if I staged your surgery? So this is something that uh, a lot of people are actively working on in order to promote more quick remodeling. So let's say I'm doing uh, a low-grade infiltrative glioma, or what I, what I think is going to be a low-grade glioma. And then my mapping suggests that I'm evoking paraphasic errors or uh, subtle speech deficits in an area that is probably tumor-infiltrated brain. I have two options. One is to resect that, and the patient will have a speech deficit postoperatively or an executive function deficit postoperatively, and then hopefully will remap. Or I can strategically leave that tumor there, knowing that it's going to grow slowly. Yes, it has a non-zero probability of over time transforming to a higher grade of tumor, but strategically leave it there. Allow that tumor to continue to grow very slowly. Watch it with MRIs. Allow the brain to remap. And I know that if I go back in there six months later, one year later, 18 months later, that tumor and the brain surrounding it will map differently and I can safely resect the same tissue because it no longer has such an eloquent function. So uh, a lot of neurosurgeons, uh, I shouldn't say a lot, some neurosurgeons will say, when you're doing a low-grade glioma, don't plan your first surgery, plan your second, third, fourth, fifth That's surgery. That's fascinating. Uh, planning 10 years down yeah. the road for knowing that it's going to grow and change and 
the brain is going to be regrowing and remapping. That's the important part. It's uh-huh. I know the tumor is going to grow regardless of what I do, and I know it's infiltrating normal brain regardless of what I do. But can I be strategic about it, what I take and I leave with the understanding that there is a non-zero probability of the patient remapping, and what I can't take today, I can take tomorrow. So that's where it gets interesting. So when people say plan for your fourth surgery, what they really mean is don't make too small of an incision and understand that your incision is going to change for wound healing issues. But it's not just incision and wound healing management. It's the brain is going to change in response to your treatment and also in response to the tumor itself. And anecdotally, there is actually quite good data to support that. Certainly, we know that the brain is plastic at not just young ages, but but quite advanced ages. But we know that when we map for subsequent low-grade glioma surgeries, the brain does map differently, not just between individuals, but between the same individual over time. And we can leverage that property as we're thinking about how we resect a tumor. Again, the whole point is, yes, I want you to live a long life but it needs to be a good one. Uh, otherwise, I haven't done much good for you. Man. That is fascinating. I mm-hmm. would never have imagined that. Unfortunately, the correct answer to my question was lasers. The right. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yes, You're also lasers. lasers. Uh, yes, lasers. Also, there are lasers. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, uh, lasers do now play a role in, in our management of tumors. And I, I did allude to it earlier. Uh, so uh, the gold standard of neurosurgical care for patients with brain tumors is resection. And for patients that I believe I can safely offer a resection, I will invariably offer a tumor resection. There's a class of patients for whom resection is not a good option. There are patients with inoperable brain tumors. Um, I, I don't really believe in inoperable brain tumors, but that's a different conversation for a different day. But for whom the risk-benefit ratio of operating on a brain tumor is unfavorable, either because of tumor location or because the patient is very frail, or because this is a recurrent tumor, or because otherwise the patient won't only undergo a biopsy. And are these the same patients that 15 years ago with METS were like, hey, sorry, there's not much we can do for you, or is this a different class of patients? Yeah, t- really, this is a different class of patients, okay. but uh, there is some overlap. So what I'll tell you is this. Patients with de novo brain metastases, I work very closely with the Gamma Knife Center uh, at Swedish Hospital, uh, and we do stereotactic radiosurgery with a lineac based system as well at, uh, at Sky Ridge Hospital. So we are very, very good at administering radiation to patients with even many, many metastases. And I'm, I'm encouraged that the paradigm in the field has trended away from whole brain radiation and toward stereotactic radiosurgery like Gamma Knife. Uh, again, that's not a development I can claim responsibility for. That's, <laughs> that's radiation oncologists becoming better. And also, again, this is a feat of engineering. So this is a multitude of beams of radiation converging in one point, guided by software that can automatically calculate the way that the beams are converging such that there is a minimization of radiation to surrounding brain, but a high radiation dose to a very particular lesion, even if the lesion is right up against your optic chiasm, even if the lesion is right up against your brainstem. The whole point is getting radiation to a place that needs it and not getting radiation to the surrounding brain, because it will injure the surrounding brain, particularly really, really critical areas like brainstem. And then sometimes surgery gets to play a part in that. So now we're so good with immunotherapy. We're so good at supportive care. We're so good at physical therapy. And we're so good at palliative care and palliating patients' symptoms and pain management and all these things that keep patients not just alive, but keep them with a high quality of life with cancer. So now cancer is becoming a chronic illness that, well, if they have oligometastatic disease or a single metastasis or even widely disseminated brain and spine metastasis, there can be a role for neurosurgeons. Maybe there's one or two dominant metastases. Or now, this is actually where it gets interesting, maybe the patient had a handful of metastases that were treated with radiation previously. And now one of the one of the metastases looks like it's changing on MRIs. So part of it can be essentially an inflammatory reaction associated with the radiation itself. That's called radiation necrosis, which is a little bit of a misnomer, but it's changing because of that. And it looks kind of like progressive tumor or it's progressive tumor. You don't know. You treat progressive tumor with potentially more radiation, but you would treat radiation necrosis with like steroids, but you need the answer. The MRI is not going to tell you the answer. So in in the past, maybe these patients have been biopsied. We could go in, we can either resect it, we can biopsy it. 
uh, since uh, you alluded to uh, to lasers earlier, well, through the exact same platform as a biopsy, I can introduce a laser into the same lesion. I can get the answer, the diagnostic answer, the biopsy, and at the same time, I can provide laser interstitial thermal therapy. I can gently heat that tissue, and regardless of whether it's recurrent tumor or if it's radiation necrosis, that inflammatory reaction, it'll treat either one. So these patients that are living longer because of advances in chemotherapy and radiation therapy, well, now it's uh, a little bit of whack-a-mole, right? Because you generate problems as a result of the treatments that you've undergone previously. Again, there's room for innovation there, and there's room for new therapies there. And that's uh, one of the areas where people like me are focused. Uh, So how can we continue to provide additive, iterative quality of life and survival benefit to these patients? And so that's, that's where the laser comes in. And I know you do research, and we've seen this field change drastically in the last 10, 15 years. What do you think is coming next? What do you think neurosurgery or this type of oncological care looks like in 10, 20, 30 years? Yeah. Are you even cutting open the skull and getting in there? All right. You heard it here first. Uh, (laughs) It's 50 years from now. Uh, the, the, The Terminators have conquered the planet. Uh, there are no humans, there are no neurosurgeons, and uh, we exist in a, in a barren hellscape as uh, brains in jars. Uh, I think I saw that on Futurama yeah. or something. But <laughs> when those brains in jars develop tumors, there is, uh, there's probably, um, uh, on a serious note, I think uh, decades from now, there are a few different answers because brain tumors are so heterogeneous. So I'll, I'll talk about specifically gliomas, tumors that arise in the brain. My sincere hope is that 30 to 50 years from now, neurosurgeons no longer will play a role in the care of those patients, period, Uh, with with maybe one exception. It's going to go in one of two directions. Uh, It's possible that my role will be that I accept the liability for pressing a button in a room somewhere. Uh, That button will release nanobots. Those nanobots will be channeled through maybe the veins or like a port in the head or something like that, those nanobots will will scour your entire central nervous system. They will selectively eat any brain tumor that's there, and then they will very calmly and gently self-destruct and be excreted through your, let's say, urine. Why not? Uh, so that's going to be the entire that's going to be the entire role for a neurosurgeon in the care of patients with brain tumors. But what I'm kind of alluding to is that when we do cadaveric studies of patients with glioblastoma, I once asked my mentor this when I was uh, when I was at Duke. Uh, he is a, a world expert in, uh, in glioblastoma, and he runs a, a very um, productive and, uh, and high-powered lab, and himself is a genius. His name's Peter Fecci. Um, like, why do patients die of glioblastoma? Because at that point, I was a resident. Um, I think it was probably my third or fourth year uh, in residency, and I had seen all these patients come into our hospital and be treated. And it's not like they're herniating. They're not dying because there's brain just fungating out of their heads. Like they have tumor and sometimes they have like progressive tumor, but they look sick. It's clear that not the only thing that is going wrong for them is this localized process in a lobe of their brain that's occupied by brain tumor. And then there's there's data um, in those cadaveric studies that the brain stems of patients with glioblastoma have glioblastoma cells in them. So the fact that we're going in there and cutting these things out to me is frankly absurd. Uh, I, I said this earlier about shunts. I will say this. I'll go to the grave saying this about brain tumor surgeries. It's it, Doing surgeries for brain tumors is a, is a stupid solution to a problem that we don't understand. But it's the best solution we've come up with so far. And we're getting better and better at implementing that solution. And the reason I do what I do and the the reason I care as deeply as I do about it and the way that it's executed is we can provide more and more benefit iteratively to these patients with the way that we do the surgery. It matters. Uh, How much of the tumor comes out correlates very directly with survival. The patient's development of neurodeficits postoperatively correlates directly with survival. Both of those things need to be executed flawlessly, and it's critical for the well-being of our patients that that is the case. But it can't be the way that we're doing it in 30 to 50 years. Honestly, like this is it's like multiple sclerosis. And I say that because a really good way to fail your neurosurgery boards is to operate on multiple sclerosis. So we understand that it's a disease of the whole brain. Yeah, we see patches of demyelination manifest on MRIs. 
but that doesn't mean that a surgery is indicated. So glioblastoma is a disease of the whole brain. We have a dumb guy answer because we have MRIs and they show us that there are clear foci of disease within the brain, but the foci of disease extend far beyond what we can image on the MRI. I know when I see a tumor on an MRI that there are cells extending as a gradient far beyond the borders of the lesion that I see. They're throughout the hemisphere. There's a pretty good chance it's in the deep structures. It's probably on the contralateral hemisphere. And I know that these patients are dying with the tumor in the brainstem. I can't take those tumor cells out. I certainly can't pick them out one by one. We need something better. The answer exists. We just don't know it. Uh, so <laughs> we haven't discovered it yet. <laughs> yeah, or yeah, exactly. It. Yeah. Um, and uh, the, the answer will eventually be probably uh, in the form of cocktails. So these tumors are incredibly heterogeneous. They're incredibly bright, and they're incredibly adaptive. And they've gotten very good at evading our own... Th this is my own soapbox, and now you've gotten me going. Uh, at evading our own uh, surveillance mechanisms. So this is the reason that immunotherapy is so promising, and it's the reason that anti-tumor vaccines have, have always thought to be promising. And to a certain extent, it's also why invariably our strategies at treating primary brain tumors like glioblastomas using our immune system have failed. It's because, yeah, our immune system is adaptive, but so is the tumor. It's very, very good at evolving around our treatments, and it's very, very good. In fact, our immune system evolves, right? It evolves in real time to address the challenges that are presented to it. And of course, it's adapted not only toward uh, infectious diseases, but it is very well adapted to finding and eradicating cells in your body that are not behaving as they should. So you and I, any given day, probably a few times a day, or maybe even a few dozen times a day, have cells that arise in our body that are aberrant enough to form a cancer. We don't have cancer. The reason we don't have cancer is because there are cells in our body that have been charged with finding those cells and eating them, literally. So Somewhere along the way, glioblastoma develops methods to evade that mechanism. There are T cells that sit inside glioblastomas, and they appear not to be doing much. They appear to be intrinsically defective. They can't communicate with the other components of the immune system the way they need to, and they can't kill cells the way they need to. They have very specific and uh, wide-reaching deficits in their ability to do their job. That's true for T cells. It probably is true uh, to at least a certain extent for B cells. Certainly it is true for the resident macrophages of the central nervous system. All of the inflammatory cells that we see populating gliomas indicate to us that they have extensive and severe abrogations in their function. They're not doing the thing they're supposed to be doing. And we haven't found great ways of getting them to consistently identify tumor as abnormal, and then act against it in a systematic way, and then sustain that activity as the tumor attempts to evolve around and it. And continue to keep up. The tumor is very, very good at shutting that kind of activity down. Interesting. Yeah, it's terrible. <laughs> this is getting yeah. dark, Eddie. Mm. <laughs> I agree with you. It's it, No, it's... um. It's it's why you know I um, I'm a, a co or sub investigator on uh, on a handful of clinical trials through the Sarah Cannon Cancer Institute. We actually have as many clinical trials through Sarah Cannon as any large academic medical institution does for patients with brain tumors. But it's also important to note that treatment for patients with glioblastoma has not meaningfully advanced in years and decades. Those clinical trials have in many cases been promising, but certainly not revolutionary. And what that indicates to me is a deficit of very profound understanding about the mechanisms by which glioblastoma self-propagates. The good thing is that there's lots of really, really smart people that also see this as a personal affront, and so they're working really hard to find the answers. Well, man, that is, that is so fascinating. And I think it, it brings me to a question I was talking to someone about earlier about just cancer in general, and what does it mean to our our health as we live longer? Is cancer getting better? Are, are we just seeing more of it because we're living longer, or are we being exposed to more things that are causing these? And I don't think there's probably an answer, but I think you would have a better answer than I would. Yeah, man, it's chemtrails, bro. Yeah, I knew it. It's chemtrails. I knew it. I'm, this I'm... isn't Joe Rogan's <laughs> podcast. Get out of here. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. I um, 
So listen, the problem with having a body comprised of cells that divide is uh, from time to time they fuck up, right? So the answer to the question um, is a little bit out of my wheelhouse. I, I suspect there are probably elements of our environment that historically humans have been exposed to lower levels of that maybe can propagate cancer. Certainly, depending on the uh, the workplaces that, that we're in, our exposures to radiation is... Uh, I was just talking to, uh, to Anne, who's here in the room with us, about how she used to be an x-ray technician, right? And so we all have to let up, and during the cases that, that I use fluoroscopy, certainly I wear lead, but that's a workplace exposure, right? So... Ionizing radiation has a very clear relationship to cancer in general, and in fact, there is some evidence that there's a relationship between exposure to ionizing radiation and, um, uh, and glioblastoma. Uh, I mentioned earlier that, uh, that I'm an immigrant. I, I was born in 86. That's the same year as Chernobyl. So uh, It's in your cells, right? Yeah, well, I, I, and that's why I'm such a good neurosurgeon. It's because I have these three extra arms, and they're very <laughs> useful. Uh, so I really think that gives it, it really endows me with a uh, with an unfair advantage. I thought we were keeping and, the X Man thing. Yeah, a yeah, secret. yeah. And these, uh, I, I do have six extra eyes that uh, pop out beneath beneath various folds. His uh, rugged good looks would, yeah, would yeah. not let you know it though. <laughs> In any case, uh, so they're clearly byproducts of a modern society that uh, that make cell division more liable to error, it, just because of DNA damage associated with things like radiation and certainly uh, nuclear fallouts. But in, in the course of like everyday life for most people, I don't know that there are a lot of exposures that uh, that we come into contact with that radically increase risk of cancer. Of course, uh, again, like cigarette smoking or something, obviously. But uh, with I was going to say. With the exception of, again, really modifiable things that are well understood, yeah. such as, I think, cigarette smoking being um, being the foremost among them, but even like uh, hot and spicy foods having some association with the, uh, the incidence true? of GI cancers. I believe it is. Yeah. I'm not a GI oncologist. Uh, if, the, if there are any GI oncologists, please feel free to, what, what do you have people do? Phone in? Message us on, on our website. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, hashtag me on Twitter. Like, hey, <laughs> you, you don't know anything, man. Just stick to brains. Um <laughs> Eat some spicy food and yeah, stick to brains. I actually eat a lot of spicy foods. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, but um, yeah, there's uh, I, I at least it's my impression that uh, that there is data to that effect. So uh, yeah, there are probably some areas of exposure consistent with modern life, but I think also modern life for all of its deficits has also endowed us with a lot of uh, tools and mechanisms by which we can live longer. And I think that's the biggest thing. We live longer, and as a result, we're more likely to accumulate diseases of aging, and certainly cancer is one of them. The longer we live, the more fucked up cells we create that then grow into <laughs> that tumors true. in our body, right? Yeah, yeah. Like it's, it's actually a very optimistic outlook, right? Like cancer is an opportunity. Uh, <laughs> yeah. we, so. <laughs> we've given it a chance to thrive yeah, because exactly. we're doing so well as a society, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, to that end, again, I have to credit my colleagues that are oncologists because, yes, part of treating cancer is literally treating cancer, but also part of treating cancer is managing all the other comorbidities that detract from quality of life in patients that live with cancer. So uh, that's that's everything from the physiatrists that are uh, ensuring that our patients are healthy and functional and have a high exercise capacity, because, of course, your ability to literally be a functional person is literally how well does your body function? We have dietitians. We have uh, all of our... I, I have not given enough credit during this podcast to our PCPs. Uh, I recently was uh, given an opportunity to, to speak at a PCP conference. And, uh, like... If, if there really is like a true battleground for human survival, it's in the office of your PCP. And your PCP is doing everything for you from controlling your diabetes to controlling your lung disease to uh, mitigating the risk factors that I don't even know about because I'm not a PCP, uh, such as your cholesterol intake and, uh, and other dietary lifestyle modifications that keep you functional. And if you even don't have cancer, it enables you, by being a more healthy, functional person, to tolerate the treatments that enable you to survive longer with cancer. So all of these things certainly are additive. Uh, it's not just like, give chemotherapy. There's so much more that enables you to survive longer and longer in the face of cancer. And systemically being healthier in the way that all the other clinicians and ancillary services enable you to be is, uh, is a really critical part of that. So 
as we talk about moving away from some of that operative stuff, we're already doing a lot of non-operative treatment. And, you know, you talk about chemotherapy, there's pills, there's radiation, there's lots of different routes. How have you seen that change in the last decade, and how much better has that gotten? Yeah, I wish I could tell you because I haven't been around long enough to see it really evolve. Uh, I alluded to immunotherapy. I think immunotherapy in the last, certainly uh, in the last five years, has been the greatest game changer in terms of patient survivorship. It's an entirely new avenue for care. I'm really excited to see how we can develop not just the ones that we currently use, but uh, but. Uh, I was gonna, I was gonna mention checkpoint blockade, but truly using dendritic cell vaccines, truly using uh, CAR T cell therapies, these cutting edge treatments that leverage modified elements of our immune system, reintroduced back into our immune system, that are even more effective at treating disease than what we currently have, which is essentially, if you were to boil down chemotherapy, it's a non-specific treatment for making dividing cells not divide so effectively. And there are cells in your body, aside from cancer cells, unfortunately, that, uh, that do need to divide, they which is why to. we have, yeah, which is, why, <laughs> which is why we have like hair loss and GI side effects associated with chemo. It's a tremendously toxic thing. So the more specific we can make our treatment, the better. Uh, and just showed me a, a post-it note that said gamma tile on it. Uh, that was my cue to say something about gamma tile. Uh, wait, wait, what is gamma tile? Uh, yeah, yeah. So this is uh, this is, is that a, at Home Depot. Uh, you can you can actually pick them up there. I think uh, five for a dollar at Home Depot. <laughs> uh, what they are is a, a flexible tile made of a compound. Uh, I believe it's made of cellulose or collagen. Uh, I'll, I'll look it up later. I should probably know what it's made of. Uh, but it's, it's a flexible tile that's made of a biodegradable material. It's impregnated with cesium that we've begun now at Swedish uh, with the help of our radiation oncologists placing in the resection cavities of our tumor patients, providing localized radiation therapy. So again, very similar to brachytherapy, for example, in the setting of prostate cancer, but enabling us to target very specifically radiation to local tissues that are radiating the adjacent brain. So in a nutshell, the best treatments for cancer down the line will be more specific and ideally they will be treatments that can evolve over time in accordance with the way that the tumor itself evolves. It will be sensitive enough, in addition to being specific for the tumor, to ferret out one single tumor cell at one time and it will have a memory. So if the tumor ever comes back, it'll recognize it again. Those are all attributes of our immune system. All of that sounds horrifying to me. It sounds way too advanced and way too scary. I, I get nervous as I hear you talk about using a robot in the OR. Like, well, yeah. what what if something goes wrong with the robot? Yeah. Uh, what if it the, the memory changes and it gets attracted to the wrong kind of cells. Well, I mean, you're you now now you're describing the plot of I've always thought that that they really need to to find a way to bridge the uh the Terminator movies and the Matrix movies because I always thought the Matrix is what resulted if the Terminators win. But yeah, that's that's you're you're looking at some sort of dystopian hellscape where uh <laughs> uh well, where where the role of the neurosurgeon is to to walk in and press the button. Push the button. Uh, and, but are are there ever issues with the robots cuz that I mean, yeah, genuinely 100%. like yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. Do they ever Every, have issues during operations, or is it so uh, well tested that? Uh, honestly, uh, I I have um, so I I'm really lucky in that I get to work with really high end companies. So the laser that I use is uh, is from a company called Monteris. Um, there is always troubleshooting and tech support available on site with me as I do the surgery. I have never had an issue with the neuronavigation that is placing the laser with millimetric precision inside of the brain exactly in the location it needs to go. I've never had issues with heat transfer. I've never actually had issues with the MRI. Certainly it's conceivable that those things can happen. Part of it is luck. Part of it is a lot of testing. And we go through a lot of dry runs as well for our patients. The only thing I've ever not wanted to be as a surgeon is surprised. And so a lot of repetition, a lot of practice, a lot of preemptive troubleshooting, and a lot of planning goes into every case. And if there's one thing I can tell uh, any surgical trainee, and certainly uh, something I've told a multitude of surgical trainees, it's don't be surprised. Any surgery that you will ever do, 
ought to have been done in your head beforehand from start to finish. And if you haven't done that, you haven't done the surgery. So that's a necessary evolution. Like, yes, in the setting of like maybe a trauma surgeon that like somebody rolls into the ED and like you do like a... a... The other day I was putting an EBD into, into somebody that literally their chest was open and they just like cracked open the chest just to see what was going on in there because the patient was, wasn't doing great. And that is unfathomable. It's like I wouldn't do that <laughs> to a human head. Uh, so I have never done a surgery that I haven't done from start to finish in my head first, and neither should any other neurosurgeon. Yeah, uh, we, we don't do exploratory surgeries. The whole point is you should know exactly what you're going to encounter at every possible branch point of the surgery. And if you are surprised during a surgery, it means you haven't done your job. All right, last question. Yeah. When are you going to come out with the nanobots? Oh, yeah. Uh, so I've been working very diligently in my basement. Um, <laughs> But my, my 3D printer's on the fritz, so uh, it, it, it may be a few more weeks at least. <laughs> well, Eddie, I, I truly look forward to hearing about the research you're working on and the progress you're making and, and getting together with you again to talk about some trauma cases in neuro for spine, for brain, and some of the stuff that uh, impacts our pre-hospital providers in a more intimate way. Uh, I've really loved the conversation today, and I thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me. This has been terrific. Yeah, this is a ton of fun. Thank uh, you. Next time, we might have to have beers. I would love that. Okay. Deal. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, I think we have an agreement. All right. Thanks for joining us, everybody, and uh, we'll crack one open next time. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for having me, Jordan. And uh, until next time. We'd like to thank our sponsor, Health One Continental Division, and Swedish Medical Center for their financial contributions to the EMM. Donations from them and listeners like you make it possible for us to fulfill our mission of producing and spreading free medical education to the masses. If you enjoy our show, please consider making a one-time or reoccurring donation to help cover our operational costs and keep the EMM awesome. Click on the link in our show notes to make a donation. Thank you for listening.